Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house this beautiful February morning. Isn't that right? Yes. And I look around and I see some faces I haven't seen for a while. And it feels good to see you. It does, we're family and we miss each other. So we're here to worship the Lord this morning. So glad you're here. So, Father, we just thank you for all the good gifts that you have given us, God, that we are all here and we all are well. And, God, we thank you for that today. We thank you for your presences in this place. And, God, I pray that as we sit here that your Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us and We'll leave this place knowing we have met with you, and God will give you praise. And God's people said, Amen. Well, welcome. Please stand with us as we worship. Has it been good to you this morning? Amen. It's been good to me. Let's worship him this morning freely without abandon.
worship you this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. You're so we good. We bow to your throne this morning. How great is you, Lord. We love you. We thank you, King. We bless you, Lord. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Has the Lord been good to you this morning? He's been good to me. We thank you, God. stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole world with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings let's shout it this is amazing
praise your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, and worship his holy name. And sing like never before, and oh my soul, I worship your holy sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. We worship, worship His holy name. Sing like, sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. For my heart to find I will find Bless the Lord Thank you, Jesus Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship your holy name. Thank you for your presence today, Lord Jesus, where we can worship you freely, Lord. God, may we never hold our worship back from your ears, Lord Jesus. Your holy name, Lord, I worship your holy name. One more time, Lord, I worship your holy name. Can we give him some praise this morning? We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We worship your holy name like never before, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory and honor. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning, BFA. We are so excited that you are here this morning. If this is your first time with us, we would love to get to know you and for you to get to know us. So text the word next steps to 94090 to get more information about BFA. Also, if you'd like to get a digital bulletin, you can also text the word weekly update to 94090 to get today's bulletin. Don't forget, tonight we have our prayer service at 530. You do not want to miss it. We intercede on behalf of our loved ones. Be there. Also, just a reminder, every Wednesday we have midweek service at 6.30 p.m. online. Pastor James is in the book of Galatians. You do not want to miss it. Just a friendly reminder, if you're in youth, we do have something for you every Sunday at 11 a.m. in our coffee shop. Please ask an usher and they'd be happy to show you where the coffee shop is. Also, every Wednesday we have a BFA youth watch party online. They would love for you to join them. So if you'd like a link, contact the church office. Also, we have a wonderful kids ministry here at BFA. Here is our children's pastor with this week's update. Good morning, BFA family. I'm Pastor Janelle, the children's pastor here at BFA. And I have an important reminder for everyone. Don't forget, BFA Kids is continuing to have church in person at 11, as well as online through the church website. All February, our elementary schoolers are learning what it means to follow Jesus' example of kindness, while our toddlers through kindergartners are learning that a friend loves at all times. Thanks, Pastor Janelle. We are so grateful for you and your team. You guys are doing awesome work over there in Kids Men. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to all of our social media platforms so you can stay up to date. Don't forget to click the little bell button at the bottom there so you can get all the notifications or when we go live for service. This has been your BFA Weekly Update. Enjoy your service. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. I'm moving a little slowly. Uh, I'm going to be 57 next month, so I can tell you all my maladies. Once you reach a certain age, you can talk. So I have this crown issue going on on my left side of my face, so I'm hurting in my jaw here. And then I'm still recovering from my shoulder surgery. It's been giving me problems. And then I got this sharp pain in my chest that's going on. I don't know what that is, pulled muscle or something. And I've had three surgeries on this knee, and I'm feeling some <laughs> arthritis this morning. So, I'm, but I'm here, bless God, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna preach through it. I know that sounds pretty pathetic, but anyway, I'm glad you're here. No matter what you may be feeling, God's been faithful, and we just appreciate your faithfulness in giving. The Bible teaches we are to give our tithes, which is 10% of our income. The Bible also speaks of offerings, and we want to remind you every month about our missions commitment. Third Sunday of every month is our missions focus, and we're just so grateful for your giving because we support missionaries all over the world and ministries locally right here as well. We also sometimes have special projects above and beyond our tithes and our missions commitment, and we've been, I've introduced with you the project, the New Exodus project, where there are people, uh, refugees from Syria, that are in these camps in Jordan and in Turkey. And we are able to send missionaries in there and Christians to witness to these folks. And people are coming to the Lord. It's just amazing how God takes this tragedy and turns it into something glorious, an opportunity for him to be glorified. And so I had in my heart that our, our district had committed to a million dollars and they're about halfway there. And I had in my heart, what if we could give $50,000 as a church? Well, I want you to know that as of today, we're over $26,000 given. So we're well on our way. 
to that project just to be a part of reaching refugees for Jesus Christ. And so again, just want to thank you for your tithes, your offerings, and even special projects. It just keeps the church moving forward. I want to pray today for those that may be struggling financially. I know with all the COVID challenges going on, some people have lost jobs. Hours have been cut back. I know my own daughter, her hours have been cut back. And so let's pray for those that are really going through those challenges at this time. God, I thank you that we can't outgive you. When we give, you give back to us, pressed together, shaken and running over, Lord. And so, God, I just pray, especially for those in our church, Lord, and, and our other believers around this country that are struggling financially because they've been laid off or their hours have been cut back, God, I pray that you would meet their needs miraculously. Lord, may they see your provision. And God, may you use your church. May we not be handicapped because of this COVID, but may we be even more powerful and give even more, Lord, unto you, God. And so we commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, there are several ways to give. You can give in the offering boxes on your way out. You can certainly give online or even on our app. But thank you for your faithfulness. You're welcome to stand with us as we worship. He's worthy this morning of our praise. Let's not hold it back. Oh, he's worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Sing it again, your word. You're worthy of it all. Oh, yes, you are. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Bless your holy name. In 
Jesus, we love you. And oh, how we love you. You are the one now. A heart to adore. Jesus, we love you. we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. We magnify your name. We love you, Lord. We love you. There is no other name but above the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we for your presence in this place. We thank you for a time of worship and praise, Lord, where we can try to express our love for you, to glorify you, God, through simple songs, Lord Jesus, of praise. We love you. And all God's children said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Continuing our series on the day of the Lord, we've been talking about the locust swarm and what that represents, that often it was a symbol of judgment, but at the same time, God wants to restore, even after bringing correction to our life, God is so good, wants to bring us from a place of devastation to a place of restoration. And so we started off at Joel chapter 2, verse 11, let's pick up there from last week. The Lord thunders at the head of his army, his forces are beyond number, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful, who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. And so for us to move from that place of devastation into restoration, we have to respond to the Lord in a certain way. And we discussed this last week. Let me go over them quickly. Number one, our first response is to return with all our hearts. 
If, we're gonna, if God's going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten, the, the times of loss, we've got to turn to him. Number two, we have to humble ourselves, and that's what it means to fast. It's a symbol of humbling yourself. I don't know what you fasted this past week. I challenged each of us to fast a certain thing. I fasted something I'd never fasted before, and it was social media and the news. And so I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a week, because I, you know, I, I love watching the news, and you know, social media, you got to stay hip and up what everybody's doing in their life. And so I gave those things up, and you know what? It felt pretty good. You know, social media can get you down, you know, you feel envious and insecure, everybody's better than you on, online, and, and then, of course, the news can be pretty depressing and make you mad, so I think I, I'm feeling pretty good, but... After today, I'm back watching some news and maybe a little social media, but maybe in a little less quantity than I have before. So fasting is good for us. It keeps us humble, and it shows our commitment to the Lord. Number three, we are to grieve our sin with godly sorrow, and we talked about how we come to the Lord in repentance. And number four, rend our hearts and not our garments. Tearing one's clothes was a sign of mourning, but God wanted us to have it from the inside out. It matters what goes on in our hearts. You can tear your clothes and nothing has changed on the inside. And so God was calling the people, if they wanted to get from that place of great loss to a place of healing, we had to have the hearts that were broken and contrite before the Lord. And so if we will respond to the Lord this way, he promises to respond to us. And God's response to us is his is a revelation of who he is. This is who God really is. He reveals himself and his nature and his character. And he did this to Moses, and he used similar words that we find here in the Joel passage. And so after he'd given Moses the Ten Commandments, God revealed himself this way. Look at Exodus 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so this is who God is. He revealed himself to Moses, and he revealed himself this way in the Old Testament. A lot of times people have this idea that the God of the Old Testament seemed to be angry and judging and and, you know, ready to wipe people out all the time. And then the God of the New Testament's more gracious and merciful. That, that's not the case. God has always been gracious and merciful. And we're going to see that, the, that these words that we're going to study this morning have been grouped together several times throughout the Bible because God wants us to know who he is. He has not hidden himself. He has revealed himself through his word. And so if you want to know God, you need to know his word. You need to study your Bible because God reveals who he is. And it's critical that we know the Lord and what pleases him and what his nature is and how he interacts with people. The reason we need to know that is because what we believe about anything will determine how we think and how we feel and how we live. And so it's your beliefs Your belief system, what you know is true in your heart, that affects how you think about life and what you're going through. It also can affect your emotions and and how you feel about things, and it certainly can affect our behavior. And so what we believe determines how we respond. Now, I consider myself a pancake connoisseur. I love pancakes. It's one of my favorite foods in all the world. I've loved them since I can remember as far back as a child. In fact, I remember one time asking my mom, will there be pancakes in heaven? Because, you know, it just wouldn't be heaven without pancakes. That was what was high on my priority list when I was just a kid. And I wanted pancakes so often that my mom finally put a mix together and I could cook in them myself. And, And through the years, I've refined the recipe And, you know, there's things in there that I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. And so, but it's it's so good, you know. And my mom always used to say the secret ingredient is TLC, tender loving care. Just make sure it's not THC because that's illegal. But uh, I put a lot of TLC in those pancakes. and, And so one time when I was in high school, my buddy and I were starving. We're hungry. 
So he went over to my house and I said, I'm going to make you pancakes, man. I make pancakes like nobody. And so I made the pancakes and, and we, I always heat the syrup. You don't want cold syrup on your hot cakes, okay? That's just not the way it's supposed to be. So I heated up the syrup, made him this big old pancake, made myself a big pancake, slather it with butter, bless God, and then pour that hot syrup on there and so we're scarfing down these pancakes. I mean, about halfway through, man, we're just pounding these pancakes, and, and he decides to put a little more syrup on his pancake, and he pours out the syrup. And just at the corner of my eye, I noticed something came along with the syrup. There was something that poured out, not just syrup, but some debris of some sort came out. And I said, hey, what was that? He goes, what was what? I said, there's something in the syrup. And we looked in the syrup, and it was chock full of ants. We had not seen this, and then so we looked at our pancakes, and sure enough, there's ants all over our pancakes, and we'd already eaten half of it, and man, it tasted good until we saw the ants, and then all of a sudden, it didn't taste good. You see, we, what we believed affected what we perceived, and then we had a new reality, and that changed our outlook. And so, I believe that we need a new reality when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. Much of our confusion, our, our discord internally, and, and our frustration in our Christian experience is because we really don't know the Lord. We have a misunderstanding of who God is. We have expectations of him that he has never promised in the word. And so what's important for us, if we're going to have a relationship with the Lord, we have to know who he is and what he says about himself because what we believe determines what we think. And what we think often influences how we feel and, and it certainly affects our outlook on life. And so I, I believe much of our, our frustration and our, our misunderstanding is because we don't know God as he has described himself. And so I'm gonna give you a list of things how God describes himself. This is not how someone else describes God. This is how God describes himself. And so the first way that God describes himself, number one, is that he is gracious. First and foremost, God is gracious. Grace is God. That's where it comes from. In fact, this Hebrew word for grace, which is Hanan, is only used of God. It's not used of people. It's not used of anyone else because no one is gracious like God is gracious. And this word hanan means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor, to bestow. So grace is God Almighty stooping down and coming as a baby in a manger to save humanity. That's grace. God stooped down. We didn't ascend to God. He came down to us. We can't save ourselves. Only God can save us by his amazing grace. And so we have, to, we have to meditate on this, the grace of God in your life. It's that free bestowal of kindness that we didn't deserve and we didn't pay for. It's the action of a superior to an inferior who has no claim for such gracious treatment. But that's who God is. I want you to know, if you really believe this, that God is full of grace that he has done the work, he called us, he rescued us. If you believe that God is gracious, it'll change the way you live. Too often we, we live by our own traditions or our own demands and ideas, and we don't realize that how much the grace of God is in our everyday life. And I wanna challenge you as we go through these characteristics, that this week during your prayer time, that you will you will say this to the Lord. You will thank the Lord for his grace that saved you. You could not save yourself. And so God stooped down, the, the creator of the universe. I mean, I liken it to my, my little grandson, Indiana. I'll, I'll stoop down and get with him on eye level. And I, I come down to love him, to hug him, to, to be his grandpa. And that's what God has done to us. And so if we will respond to the Lord... And we will understand his grace and, and, and believe it, really believe that God is gracious. Then it'll change our life. 
It'll change how we live our life because we'll know that God is so merciful and kind to us. The second way that God reveals himself here in the book of Joel is compassionate. God is compassionate. And again, I'm going to define a few Hebrew words, not so you'll think I'm smart, because you could do this yourself with the right tools, but it helps us go a little deeper, because the English language is limited. In fact, the English language has borrowed from a lot of other different languages, like connoisseur. That's not, you know, I think that's French, you know, hopefully. Uh, And and it's not only borrowed from, from other languages, it is borrowed from Greek and Hebrew. And so when we do a word study, we get a deeper understanding of what God is speaking. And so this word compassion is rahum. And it pictures a deep, kindly sympathy and sorrow felt for another who has been struck with affliction or misfortune, accompanied with a desire to relieve the suffering. It indicates a merciful and forgiving character and attitude. And so do you believe that God has compassion for you? Do do you really believe that he is merciful and forgiving? And do you really believe it is his desire to relieve your suffering? Now, there are times that God won't relieve it because he has a greater purpose or a greater plan, but God really feels for us, for his people. That's what compassion means, to, to really feel it inside and We see this in the ministry of Jesus. Often it said that Jesus was moved with compassion. And so he would be moved with compassion and he'd do a miracle. He'd be moved with compassion and he would feed the 5,000. And so when Jesus was moved with compassion, he was moved to action. Because that's what compassion does. It doesn't just feel bad for you. It does something to help you. Compassion is not just a feeling. It results in an action. And so wherever you're at in your life, whatever you're going through, believe that God has compassion for you. No matter what is going on, God cares. He absolutely cares. His heart is with you. His heart is for you. And it's his desire to relieve your suffering if it's according to his will and purpose and plan. And so, again, in your prayer time, I encourage you to thank the Lord for his compassion. And think of those times when he showed you compassion, where you know it was the hand of God that helped relieve your suffering. Because what we believe about God's compassion will change how we think. It'll change how we respond to the challenges of life. Because if you know God is gracious... And if you know he's full of compassion, it will give you a sense of peace that you're going to be okay. No matter what happens, God loves you. And he feels for you. Another characteristic of the Lord is he says that he's slow to become angry. Now it's very interesting. This phrase in the Hebrew literally translates to be long in the nose. That's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. Now, I qualify, bless God. I've been told ever since I was a kid that I had a Bob Hope nose. Now, some of you are younger. I was like, who? Bob Hope was known for his ski slope nose, and so am I. And, of course, mine has been broken, so the ski slope takes a turn kind of midway through. Now, it's funny because... That doesn't sound like a compliment or a good characteristic to be long in the nose. I love in Song of Solomon, you know, if you ever read Song of Solomon, it's, it's the love story in the Bible. Woo, baby. It, it's intense. And, and here's Solomon, you know, wooing his bride. And he's, he says all these different things about her physical traits and characteristics. And he comes to this one place and he says, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. If I said that to my wife, I think I would be sleeping on the couch for a while. I mean, doesn't sound real complimentary, but uh, nonetheless, that's, that's how it's described. Hopefully she took it as a compliment. But this phrase, to be long in the nose, is an idiom describing slow and steady breathing, as opposed to short and rapid breathing associated with anger. So 
To be long in the nose is to take long, deep breaths. Not, not the short, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're ready to rumble, you know, like a bull. And so that's what that phrase means, to be long in the nose, is to be long-suffering. Being able to breathe slowly. I mean, my smartwatch actually tells me when to breathe. Tells me when to get up. It's like having a, you know, a second wife. I mean, it's telling me everything to, that I've got to do. And one of those is to breathe on occasion. I'm glad it reminds me, or otherwise I would, I would have died. So God shows us how to breathe. Slowly. Deeply. And that's how God treats us. What's amazing about the Lord is he is so patient. I mean, sometimes he would rate generations, even centuries before bringing judgment. Because God's judgment is his last resort. And so God is slow to become angry. You know, sometimes we think God's mad at us. And we live our life like God's mad at us or, or just can't wait to punish us. That is not the God of the Bible and that is not the God we serve. God is patient with us. He is long-suffering with us. He takes deep breaths with us. He gives us time to change and to repent and to turn around. God shows us this, this incredible patience. And so, do you believe that? If you, if you live under this fear that God's always mad at you, you, you're, you need to change your way of believing. Because we, we know, because God said it again and again, that he is long-suffering. He is patient with us. In fact, you know, I, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I'd like it to be today. It would be awesome. And I, I, I got some bills I have to pay, so it'd be great to be able to not have to do that. You know, whatever your reasons are, no. But you know that the reason Jesus hasn't come yet is because God is patient. There's more people to be saved. And so if we want that to happen sooner, let's get busy. Let's start getting, reaching out to people, bring them to the Lord so we can go home, bless God. But I, I want you to know this. As you relate to the Lord, as you live your life, God's not waiting for you to mess up so he can whack you on the head. God is patient. He is long in the nose for us. The fourth characteristic God reveals about himself is that he is abounding in love. Another Hebrew word, chesed, and it's best translated loving kindness. Again, there's no English word that perfectly describes the word chesed. And so it's usually hyphenated as loving kindness because it encompasses both of those characteristics, both love and kindness, steadfast love, mercy, faithfulness, goodness, strength, and devotion. It's one of the most important terms in the Old Testament because it represents the covenant God had with his people. He loved them with an everlasting love. It was abounding in love. It was overflowing with love. Jolene teases me because whenever I get a drink, I fill it to the brim. You know, I'll I'll make my espresso and I'll, I'll get whipped cream that's like hanging over the side. And, and inevitably, because I always fill it to the brim, I spill it on the floor. You know, just even trying to walk, you know, obviously my whole left side's messed up, so I'm walking funny. But anyway, I forgot to tell you about the ingrown toenail on the left side. <laughs> that's as far as I'll go. Okay, but God is abounding in love. Yeah, his love spills over. He doesn't care. He, he wants his love to flow over. We've been promised an abundant life through Jesus Christ. But if we're not experiencing that abundant life, it may be because we're not, we don't understand his love. God's love is not conditional. He loves us no matter what. It is, it is incredible the way God expresses his love throughout the entire Bible. Some religions teach God is angry and, and that God doesn't, isn't relatable and that he's full of rage and judgment. That's not the God of the Bible. It's a God of love. Certainly, God disciplines those he loves, and there will be time for judgment, God, because God is not only love, he is just. And, and as a just God, he must punish sin, unless we repent. And so do we believe 
God loves you. I mean, do you believe that God is just crazy in love with you and has this incredible kindness in your life? Again, as you pray this week, will you thank the Lord for his kindness? Would you, would you rem remind yourself of times that he loved you and that he expressed kindness to you? We can, we can focus on all the negative or all our problems, or we can remind ourselves of this incredible love, has said. He abounds in love. He abounds in kindness. And if, if we believe this, if we really believe this, it'll change how we feel. It'll change our life. Another way God describes himself is he relents from sending calamity. Again, judgment is God's last resort. He'd much rather show mercy. We see this same grouping of words to describe God in the book of Jonah. I love the book of Jonah. One of these days I'll teach a series on it. I know I've got like 19 series all ready to go eventually, but Jonah is this, this great story. We can all relate to Jonah because he's a prophet and God says, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them in 40 days I'm gonna wipe them out because of their wickedness. Now what's interesting is Jonah is Jewish, but Nineveh is not part of Israel. In fact, they're an enemy of Israel. And so God was going to bring judgment to this wicked city. I mean, it was wicked. It was like Las Vegas on steroids. And so Jonah's like, I ain't going there. He doesn't want to do that. And so he heads the opposite direction. And you know the story. God, he gets swallowed by a big fish and after three days gets barfed up on the beach. And after you've been through that experience, you're willing to pretty much to do anything. And so he heads back to Nineveh and he preaches to them. And I think... I think Jonah was kind of glad they were all going to die. They were an enemy of Israel. And so he goes, 40 days, you're all going to be wiped out. And then something happens he probably didn't expect. They repent. The king all the way down. I mean, he called the fast. He called them to repent, to wear sackcloth. Even the animals had to fast and wear sackcloth. And this is not what Jonah expected. They humbled themselves. They believed in God. And this is what happened. Look at Jonah 3.10. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, that's all God wanted. He wanted them to, return, to turn from their evil ways, to repent. He had compassion, there's the same word, and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, oh Lord, is, not, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. It's like he's complaining about this. God, I knew you're gracious, doggone it. It's what I was afraid of, that you're gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, same phrase, abounding in love, same Greek word. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Wham, wham, wham. Sounded like me and all my maladies. I mean, it's like he is bummed they're not going to die. He wanted them to die. And not only that, he's probably embarrassed. I mean, he's been telling people, you're all going to fry. You're going to fry. In 40 days, you're going to fry. And then they repent, and they don't fry. And so now he's embarrassed. Because what he said was going to happen is not going to happen. And so Jonah cared more about his pride than about people. Sometimes I do too. I realize in my own life that I'm to be to respond like the Lord as well. And so there are so many times when God could have judged us, and He instead relented. God has not caused our troubles, but He'll use them for our growth and for His glory. But do you believe that God has been merciful to you? He didn't do what should have been done to us. And that leads to the sixth characteristic. The Lord turns and shows pity. Again, the same word for return to me with all your heart. If we return to the Lord, he turns to us. He, he brings us back to where we belong. He shows us pity and he does not treat us as our sins deserve. We do not get what we deserve. 
because of the God we serve. Look at Psalms 103. Again, the same grouping of words. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. Same Hebrew words. Slow to anger, long in the nose, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Listen to this. This is worth being a Christian just for this. This is so awesome. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Is that incredible? No matter what we've done or where we've been, we come to the Lord and repent. We fear the Lord. We need to fear the Lord. There's a, there's a lack of a healthy fear of the Lord in the world today. But when we fear the Lord, then he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. Is that amazing? You know, God calls upon us to forgive others like he forgave us. I mean, that's not easy. Come on, let's be real. Sometimes it's hard to forgive people that have hurt us. And even if we say the words, we still have the feelings, right? You know, it may take a while for those feelings to go away. And, but what's so amazing is the moment we come to God, the, that moment he forgives us. And he treats us like we've never sinned. That's incredible. God forgives all our sins and does not treat us as our sins deserve. We need to think about that. That this is the God we serve. And finally, the Lord will leave a blessing. Now the people in Joel's day deserved judgment. They deserved a curse, but but Joel warned them, if you'll just turn to the Lord, he is this kind of God. And he will even leave a blessing when we don't deserve it. Not only will God not punish us as we deserve, he'll bless us as we don't deserve. It is critical that we know the Lord and his nature and his character. It's, it's so critical in our relationship with, the, with God to know who he is because it affects every other, other part of our life. Sometimes we struggle in our faith because we don't think that God is compassionate. Sometimes we wrestle with the trials of life because we, we question, is he really gracious? And so we have to change what we believe. We need to Believe according to God's word, no matter what our circumstances are. Don't, don't base it on your feelings. How many know feelings are fickle? That's not what we base our relationship with the Lord on is how we feel. But I will tell you, if we think the right way, then we'll begin to feel the right way. Again, the, this amazing favor of the Lord. God's desire is to bring favor. Cling to that. Hold on to that. This week, I encourage you, hold on that God is gracious. Hold on to the fact that he is compassionate. He wants to alleviate your suffering. Hold on to these truths that he relents from sin, sending calamity, that he is patient, he's, he's long-suffering, and that it's his desire to bless, not to curse. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Is there anyone here today who has not given their life to Jesus Christ? I want to give you that chance today. If you're ready to know a God like this, maybe you've thought of God differently. Maybe you thought God was against you, or maybe you thought God was only wanted to punish you. But, I, but after hearing this, I would hope you would want to follow a God like this because of who he is and how he loves and so if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you want a new life, you want to follow this God of the Bible, would you just slip up your hand, anyone in this place? I'm going to give your life to the Lord today. Amen. Amen. You put your hands back down. You raised your hands, and there may be more that are watching online that are ready to put their hope in the God of the Bible, the gracious God, the compassionate God. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and yet God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. 
as far as the east is from the west, he removes our sin from us. And so if you prayed that prayer, or if you raised your hand and you're ready to pray that prayer, just repeat after me, whether you're at home or here. And fellow believers, would you join with me in this prayer? Dear Jesus, I know I have sinned. I've done things wrong. I need a savior. I can't save myself. So I'm asking you to save me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead and I believe you will take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you need to tell somebody. You can call the church, you can send us an email or a text because we wanna help you in your journey. For the rest of us, I wanna challenge us this week. Would you go over these qualities and characteristics? Think about them in your prayer time. Call to remembrance this God we serve because if you believe according to God's word, it'll bless the rest of your life. It'll put things in perspective. It'll bring clarity if we only believe. Would you stand with me? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You're free to remain or come to the altars or you're free to leave at this time. God bless you.